All right, well, it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce to you Richard Schroeder. Richard is the CEO, president of First Step, uh, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about how he got into that position. Uh, affiliated with World Hope, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, I'm sure we'll cover a little bit about that relationship as well. I had the privilege and blessing of meeting Richard probably about three, four years ago now, right? An hour or so. When uh, first step, Richard was just uh, taking the first steps and first step, and uh, it has been just amazing to see how God has blessed uh, Richard's faithful efforts. Uh, and uh, and as he'll tell you, this is still a work in progress, but it really I think holds a lot of potential uh, for growing and mushrooming and, and being replicated in a lot of different ways. So, Richard, uh, why don't you come on up and share with us, and let's give Richard a warm Easter call. Uh, I, I'm going to start with a, a little, there's a CNN did a presentation on First Step, a little feature, and it will take, I think, about five minutes. When it gets boring, whatever, we can turn it on. <laughs> but uh, we're just going to show it, and it gives an idea of what we're talking about, and then I'll kind of give the broader, um, your context of it. Here we go. Yep. It's a village brimming with mangoes, loaded with market potential. And yet, they often wind up on the ground, not in stores. In this village outside Freetown, Sierra Leone, a lack of infrastructure means farmers have struggled to turn their mangoes into money. Sierra Leone is uh, naturally endowed with so many uh, resources, uh, including the uh, agri-based resources. And so you find out that we have uh, uh, fruits like mangoes, pineapples, all over the country, but they are being wasted. And um, there, there, there is not much value added to, to these uh, uh, resources. But a new juice factory is giving local farmers a fresh start. They can now fill crate after crate with mangoes and sell the fruit to Africa Felix, a juice manufacturer. The company pays farmers about $250 to $300 for each tree harvest. That's a huge jump from the $15 they get at the local market. Inside the factory, mangoes are sorted, then churned into a juice concentrate. It's the country's first significant value-added export since the Civil War ended nine years ago. We are targeting the factory niche of the business. Obviously, because Sierra Leone has got such a difficult past, it's uh, having a fruit juice coming from Sierra Leone, we think, will have a, a, a very, very good impact into European consumers that can now choose something tangible coming from a place they were thinking there was only war, uh, famine and death. Africa Felix is majority owned by First Step, a commercial subsidiary of the American NGO World Hope International. First Step created Sierra Leone's first special economic zone. It's a 54-acre, low-tax industrial park designed to attract foreign companies. Africa Felix is the first tenant and enjoys a three-year tax holiday along with security, electricity and water supplies. We're just making it possible for businesses to easily establish uh, and, and employ people to start processing resources locally instead of what always happens in Africa, natural resources are dug up, brought someplace else, uh, cut down or taken out of the water, brought someplace else and processed and then sent back to Africa or other places in the world. When the, the real, the value addition is where jobs are created, where income is created, and you know, where an economy can really find its engine. With Africa Felix up and running, and farmers receiving increased profits, the government sees plenty of potential. First step uh, is doing something that is history, is on of, uh, uh, in, in the contemporary history of our country. And they are changing the lives of people in the sense that they can see development practically taking place in our own lifetime. Special economic zones have started popping up across Africa following their wide success in Asia. Some analysts worry the zones won't work in countries without a well-developed labor force or infrastructure. But First Step says its approach will set it apart, especially when it comes to recruiting future tenants. There has to be a commitment to, to not only the, the bottom line, the financial bottom line. We're looking for tenants that, that also are passionate and, and care about their impact in terms of 
social impact, environmental impact. It's an impact that First Step expects will create thousands of jobs while showing foreign companies that Sierra Leone is open for business. We have created the enabling environment for companies to come in and do their business without hindrance. And they can take the cue from Africa Felix, from the special economic zone, and they will know that this is a time to come into Sierra Leone. Starting with mangoes, Sierra Leone hopes to rebrand itself as the place to reap the fruits of investment. Zane Vergy for Mom. Raise your hand if you've got savings and whiplash. You know, from car insurance companies shouting, save 500 bucks over here. No, save 300. Okay, well, that's uh, kind of about a, I feel a little awkward. I feel like I need a <laughs> podium or something, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so, the, the concept of First Step is something that uh, I, I've been working on for some time. I began my career uh, in international development because I come from a Mennonite community, any Mennonites. Canadian Mennonite. And uh, I went to uh, Bangladesh, I volunteered for three and a half years with the Mennonite Central Bank in Bangladesh. I had an ex amazing experience. Uh, it was one of those things, you know, where you really learned to live with the poor and learn about the poor and learn many things that were just, just, and just, look, uh, um, you know, I built a grass hut and had a light floor and woke up with hands in my ear on running and, and all those things that you know, people talk about. Um, but there was something then that was quite struck me about this work that I was doing. And we were an NGO amongst a sea of other NGOs that were trying to do the same sort of thing. We were all kind of battling for target groups. We were trying to serve this community or that community. And um, one of the uh, one of the striking things about about Bangladesh at the time was that there was an emergence of this garments and textile sector. And I knew a lot of the people, the, the people that were in garments and textiles, that were, uh, were kind of jerks. There were young guys like me, kind of jerks. They were so, so sure of themselves. They were entrepreneurs. They were setting up uh, these factories in the middle of downtown Dhaka amongst poverty, taking advantage of poverty to create wealth, bringing in garment or textiles from Korea, assembling it into, you know, a finished clothing, and then exporting it, but employing in the process millions of women in terrible conditions, as we know, right? But this is what struck, so here I was a 22 whatever year old guy, and I was in Bangladesh watching this, and coming from a very liberal background, you know, where you see the businesses as the enemy, as the enemy to the creators of poverty somehow, right? <clears throat> And um, what's fascinating for me to see when I come in from the rural areas where I work to Dhaka, the center of this massive amount of poverty, where that a lot of the poor people that were trying to serve in the rural areas were coming to Dhaka to get jobs in the garments and textiles factories that were being set up by these young kind of scrappy entrepreneurs. And here we were in the rural parts of Bangladesh fighting each other as, as NGOs and angry, having these meetings. You're encroaching on our space. We're supposed to target these women here for doing this, this you know, community development initiative, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it, this was the part of the whole conversion, my whole kind of this conversion experience that I kind of went through with respect to what is the best way to be seeking development. And I went to grad school, where you guys are right now, right? <laughs> I think they're Eastern, I went to a place in Canada. <coughs> and that was amongst this whole kind of cohort of people. And we were, some of us, it was a, a mixed program at the time. Some of us, like, bleeding heart, do-gooders in this development program, right? Then there was the MBAs that were, some of them had just done investment banking, you know, stints. Some of them were blah, blah, blah. And I hated those guys. Man, they, right? <laughs> And then there's other ones, for whatever reason, in the Canadian government, th there were 
there were the ones that were um, going into um, international affairs and uh, that's sort of, we're going to be civil servants for whatever, and those were okay, right? right? But those those business guys were so freaking selfish and so confident, right? And so confident. And I remember, you know, going out. One, I had this friend, his name was Corey, and he was ferociously smart. He was, I think, he was the youngest of thirteen kids in his family, and uh, and. He was in the MBA program, and man, that guy, he would go out and drink, and drink and drink and drink. And I, sometimes I would go pick him up, or whatever, he would just, whatever. And it, I remember him going on, and he had done a stint with um, an investment banking firm in Canada, in Toronto, but before that. And then he was giving it to me, and he said, you know, you, Richard, you, in your, you know, whatever, you're going to do development. You don't do development, I do development. I, the guy who's in international business, I'm the one who does development. You do nothing. You're the one who sits there and maybe puts a picture of a poor person or a poor kid on some brochure and hands it around to churches and asks people to get money for it, to do something. But you don't do nothing. You just, you just sell poverty, you know? And you let business ultimately and then sooner or sometimes you kind of shake your fist at businesses and say you want something to be done this certain way, you want blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it does some good, but most of the time it doesn't. It says, we, the MBA, the people that you hate, we do development, you do nothing. <laughs> In fact, he said, you undermine the self-esteem and confidence of the people you're trying to serve, and you're freaking racist. Right? And he didn't use the word freaking, he said another word. <laughs> right? Um, I, I, I was friends with Corey, he's actually he's very successful, he's in banking now. But the, there was a problem for me because there was some truth to what he was saying. There was some core, some truth. When we talk, at least in the realm of economic development, we in the NGO world, we do not get it. We do not get it. Most of the time, we do not get it. My, most of my career has been in the in, in, in NGO, in nonprofit, kind of efforts to support development. And I, I did microfinance. And I established a number of microfinance institutions and led some technical support for some other ones that were failing. And, um, uh, and initiated some turnaround efforts and started some. My, uh, my, my main initial claim to fame in, uh, in microfinance was in Kosovo, where I set up a microfinance institution and a peace and reconciliation initiative, and then also set up a, a pledge filing office for the banking system in Kosovo. Um, and I love microfinance, there's real power to it, but it's getting a little old. Right? And it's also taken over by the private sector. And it's not nearly, I think, what we were thinking it would have been in the 70s and 80s and 90s and whenever when we were talking about microfinance. Microfinance is going to solve these problems. So many problems. We can deal with so much. And there is some power, but it's not what we said it would be. It's not. And NGOs did some good work, but there's more to do. And it's tricky. Because we're out of our depth. We're not the people, we in the NGO world, are not the people to be doing a lot of, or to, we're missing a, like a key ingredient to what economic development is. Amazingly, we have to acknowledge that it is about entrepreneurs and business. And as much as inclusive as we can, but it has to have that fiery, that core. Those guys in Bangladesh who started those, those uh, garments and textile mills, those, Men and women with the fire in their eye, they are the entrepreneurs. They're, if they're super confident. They are going to do this and they're going to risk other people's money. They're happy to do that. They risk their own money. They'll fail sometimes, but sometimes they succeed. And yet those, those people are the building blocks for economic development. It was in that context that I came up with the first step concept. I was a program manager for World Hope, and 
Pardon me. And we decided, I, uh, I, I convinced one of the donors and board members to finance a feasibility study for developing this different model. And I planned it up really, really nice. I was traveling in Egypt with this, this financier, this donor, a very, also a business guy. Uh, and, um, you know, just kind of giving a portion of his money to World Hope. And I met with him and in this, this the most exotic place you can possibly imagine is a, a coffee shop in the middle of Cairo. It's been open for 200 years every day, 24 hours a day. It's one of the oldest in the world, called the issue. And we sat and talked for two hours describing this model. The idea is, we as an NGO, we have a certain leverage in Sierra Leone, West Africa. Sierra Leone is in Africa. A lot of people don't even know where it is. <laughs> we have goodwill. We have a big community. We have a lot that's worth something in Sierra Leone. But what we don't do well is we're not really promoting economic advancement in the country. And there's a lot of other peers that we have as NGOs in Sierra Leone. There's a lot of them. Well, they bounce off each other. I don't know, if, have any of you done like this kind of thing, been to developing countries in the NGO world? Yes. And there's a lot of us driving in white 4 by 4s right? Has a logo on the side, yeah? We kind of go to the same coffee shop, like the radio. There's a lot of us. And then local kids, smart kids. What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to for an NGO, right? Big bucks. For us, it's, you know, there's, it's not money for, for American NGO going to, to NGO work. But if you live in Sierra Leone, and if you can get a job in an NGO, you can become whatever, country director, you can become something. Man, that, you score. And score if you're an entrepreneur, a natural entrepreneur, if you've got that fire. And if you get to be an NGO, and you can harness your entrepreneurial abilities and become a really good, you score, you win. Incentives are developed, are aligned in this kind of crazy way where we in the NGO world can undermine a lot of the incentives of these powerful people in any society to do something transformative in their own community. And we're leading them into different kind of work. I'm speaking in generalization, so please be good news, right? Obviously. The idea that we said, it's like, how can we try to combat this? How can we be about these building blocks of businesses and entrepreneurship? And kind of on reflection of supply chains and thoughts, we realized, man, there are some key supply chains in these countries, in Sierra Leone, that is just not functioning for lack of infrastructure, for lack of an industrial processor, for lack of an engagement to the global economy. So you saw mangoes, right, on that CNN clip. There was, in Sierra Leone, there are loads and loads and loads. Two months of the year, there are loads of mangoes. So many, 90% of them rot. They rot. They're on the ground. People are starving, but you just can't eat that many mangoes and just get a little weary of it. So in the remotest villages of Sierra Leone, you go there to the poorest parts of the world, and people will give you bags and crates of mangoes. Right? It's not monetized for lack of infrastructure. Businesses can't emerge around that value chain in Sierra Leone because there's no one to sell it to. So the idea is we, World Hope International, we leverage this goodwill that we have with the country, with the president, World Hope, I'm in it, right? But World Hope happens to be um, uh, Wesley, and uh, the president of Sierra Leone happens to be president right now. And so there was a, this opportunity, <coughs> pardon me, there was this opportunity to advance this notion. And at first, I think, because 
the uh, CEO of World Hope International, the NGO, happened to be a very dynamic leader uh, who is now the head of the Wesleyan Church. She met with the president, the president said, sure, I'll send an NGO, let's do, let's do whatever you want. And, and um, they gave us this opportunity to do this, to raise money, to find tenants. And our the idea was in a country where there's hardly any infrastructure, we are going to build industrial infrastructure and promote key value chains that need that infrastructure, that industry. So we, we arrange for a legal arra ar arrangement. We get a, a law firm in DC to work with us. They gave around $2 million of pro bono legal support to create a legal environment, to create a legal framework for businesses, from international businesses, to invest in Sierra Leone. That was passed through Parliament and ratified, and then we got that first tenant that we saw, that factory, that juice factory. There's more problems. There's no energy. We need to construct the roads, construct the water systems, construct the effluent control, <coughs> and there's deeper problems. We don't know how to get, there's no, there's no organization. All these mangoes are throughout Sierra Leone, in the poorest villages in the world, and the NGO says, listen, what we can do is we can organize the villagers and help this. That's our thing, community development. That's our thing. The business guy says, you do that. You organize those villages, you know, work with their traditional structures, they have, they have, they're, they're cooperatives, help them, help them to get kids and whoever, whatever, to, and then the free time to gather up all those mangoes bring them to the factory, we'll process them and sell them internationally. So they put them into big drums, process, send them through that big machine and then put them in big drums and export them internationally. There's this complementarity that can, that can work. The NGO, if you can create a space for the NGO to do its thing and create a space for those business people and entrepreneurs to do their thing, then this um, kind of this amazing synergy can happen, right? where a value chain can develop, smallholders can, can feed into it, and economic growth and opportunities can emerge. <clears throat> in doing this first one, right, in Africa Field of Juice, we ran into a host of problems then. Now suddenly, this Indian steel company comes to us and says, hey, you brought the first factory to Sierra Leone in really 50 years, the first major factory to come to the country. You're doing the, ma the first major value-added export. We, as this Indian steel company, recognizing that the world steel industry has got too much capacity, but you know that steel is mostly used in infrastructure, and West Africa has hardly any infrastructure. We want to build a steel plant in Sierra Leone and start because they've got iron ore. We want to add some value to the iron ore and start making rebar and other construction steel products. Be the first in all of West Africa to do an integrated steel mill. Because we, environmentalist, liberal person, liberal, they're, they're going to make rebar, steel rebar, out of coal and iron. And they're going to invest two hundred million dollars in this. But I know it's bad for the environment. We right? have to bring in loads and loads of coal and coke and whatever from Sierra Leone and Mozambique, bring it up the coast, drop it off there. And I'm like, can we just, I don't know, grow eucalyptus trees and make energy that way? Can we do something, you know, really fuzzy? And, you know, this is a hardcore economic, so you have to make a decision. Sierra Leone has a total of 30 megawatts like pumping through its national electricity grid. Do you have any idea what 30 megawatts is? It's like a big wind farm in South Dakota produces 30 megawatts of power. There's hardly anything. A country of 6 million people. There's no industrial jobs. Hardly any. Unemployment is in the 50. Like I said, if, you're, if you've got vision and if you're an entrepreneur and you're a fighter and you need a job with an NGO, you score. So, of course, 
we want to bring, we want to help bring the steel in the world. So just two weeks ago, we had an opportunity to speak to one of the world's largest jewelry companies in New York City, the CEO, the chairman of the board, the COO, and he said, we want to cut and polish diamonds in Sierra Leone. We want to invest $10 million to make like an ethical diamond cutting. I guess what I'm, and then I just got a text this morning, too. Joel wants to buy this juice. It's like the, the opportunities for synergy are astonishing. The opportunities for leveraging the goodwill that we as NGOs have created in company to make an environment that's conducive for investment is profound and powerful. But I think that we just have to be kind of <coughs> pivoting, and I think we are already. I think the whole NGO world, you're not law, you know NGOs, right? You, you, yes. um, the whole NGO world is in this state of this weird kind of, you know, what is, what are we actually doing? And, and who are our constituents? Um, so there is this, <clears throat> I think, interesting window of time to be doing something a little bit different, to be working more with the Tiffany and Cartier's of the world, rather than, uh, you know, which would be, I, hearing myself 20 years ago, if I would hear myself say that, it would just like, go away. It's like the enemy. Um, but we can serve the poor. We can do something amazing if we're willing to kind of reshape how we structure what it is that we do. <clears throat> but in my mind, I also think that the window of time for doing it is somewhat limited. You know, I talked about the garments and textile industry in, in Bangladesh and how, how in Bangladesh, in 1970, there was no garments and textile industry. Then some Korean company came and made a mistake by investing in training and creating a small one and training 130 Bangladeshi women. And I think they even brought them to Korea. This is in 1970. And then a flood and a war, things broke down. But those women who were trained, they realized how simple this was. This whole global industry, where designs are brought in from the global market, which fabric is brought in from the global market. You add cheap, cheap Bangladeshi labor, and you export a finished product. And it sounds rudimentary. It sounds like a very, very first step of economic development. But starting from those 130 women that were trained, after this company daily kind of, kind of folded in, in Bangladesh, those 130 women became entrepreneurs themselves and they do the exact same thing that they're, they, they're creating. And it birthed a gigantic industry that's now employing millions of women who never had formal employment before. Right? And but the, the problem is also that the context in which many of them, in which that industry was birthed and developed, is not conducive to safe working conditions, to re respect for human rights and gender awareness. So th there's a clear role for NGOs to be working and helping to shape the initial birth of those sectors in the poorest countries. And and helping to, to shape and formulate a, these nucleuses of economic growth in a, in a, in a more ethical way. <clears throat> you know, from 1970 to now, I think that there's roughly 3 million women that work in the Bangladesh and the textile sector. But to do that again is very difficult. I think the window of time with this model of using cheap labor to access the global market is coming to an end. I think that it's less and less of a relevant factor for companies to consider as they are planning their, their, their global production, chain plans, whatever. 
And I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, The Terminator, the first one. Has anyone seen that one? There's a great scene in The Terminator where this guy, he, I can't, he's the father of the boy, he, ultimately. He, it's weird. But he, he, uh, he says, you know, this machine, this Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first one is a bad guy, right? And he says, that machine is relentless. He is relentless. He is going to hunt you down. He is going to blah, blah, blah. And he gives this great speech. I, the next time I'm going to show that as a video, because it's a great speech. The point is, is that automation in that machine is closing and closing and closing and closing the number of jobs that are available in this kind of technique for serving, for engaging the poor. 30 years ago, or more, there were lots and lots of women in Malaysia and Singapore and China, or not China, but that were putting circuits, you know, making circuit boards and doing things like that. Those, that doesn't happen anymore, right? That's all automated. They're, they're, they are saying, even in the garments and textile industry, that you're using less and less and less labor to, to actually make garments and textiles. For a host of industries, they're becoming more and more and more automated and the avenues to serve, to actually create economic activity that engages the poor are becoming less and less and less less. That machine is working against this. This is the, one of the main instruments that we, the world, has known for actually promoting equitable economic development is this kind of model started by the Japanese or well, actually probably way before that. Even. But the Japanese and then the Taiwanese and the Singaporeans and the Hong Kong Chinese and the whatever was okay, get the poorest people, get them engaged in something that is relevant to the global economy, and though and then that is the first step for this industrial process that then related and supporting and more specific things kind of build on that. But that as an avenue is becoming less and less relevant. My fear is that the parts of the world that, that don't have this robust economic growth from that are not going to experience it as an instrument. There may be other things. So as I said, we were talking to this diamond jewelry firm in New York two weeks ago, and they said, we have factories in Botswana, Namibia, South Africa other places that cut and polish diamonds. But we don't we see it only as a tax. We don't they don't do it well. They don't do it well. In fact, it's only a loss maker for our company. We see it because the government has said you have to cut and polish diamonds in our country if you want the diamonds. And the company does it, they say it just isn't working. I mean we'll do it, we'll continue to do it because we want the diamonds. But we'd much rather send them to India or increasingly to Israel where they can then do it in an automated fashion and cut and polish it, cut with machines and computers, then do it in Namibia, blah, 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 but the governments are forcing us to. Well, I think our challenge in Sierra Leone is we want to reshape that model and get to the roots and causes for the inefficiencies and, and problems. Part of it, uh, to say, is that in Namibia and Botswana and other places, they mostly have men doing the cutting and polishing, for whatever reasons, and in India it's mostly the women on the deck. Vietnam, yeah, too. Um, yeah. Uh, for my own, like, personal story, I am a, a believer. The reason I'm in this work and the reason I'm doing this is because I'm a Christian and I want to keep the command of Christ to serve the poor. I remember I, when I was in Kosovo, at the end of my three years there, I got cancer for some reason, it bad. And they, they shipped me off to, to Baltimore. I had colorectal cancer. It was stage three. It was, you know, they were saying, you know what, we're probably going to check out. This is not good. And they rushed me to Baltimore. And I had like two years of surgeries and chemotherapy and blah, blah, blah. There was a time, this was right at the end of my NGO life, and I was thinking, yeah, now I'm looking at my body as a swollen like twice its size. I think, crap, you know, all I wanted to do, I volunteered for all those years in Bangladesh, 
went to Kosovo, did I? And I, I really got the sense that I'm missing something here, that if you committed to serve your life to serving that work, and then you, you get a real taste for how short life is, and you can't ignore the fundamentals of actually what it means to serve the poor. And that means to deal with those guys like Corey McDonald and the guys like blah, 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 who you don't necessarily like, but you realize there are fundamental pieces to actually helping to address the situation. So that's my story, and I'm open for any questions. I don't know if there's anything else. So, like the diamond sector in Sierra Leone is complicated. Uh, it's it's dominated by uh, uh, a minority group in Sierra Leone called the Lebanese. Right? I think you've probably seen it in all of West Africa. And um, then there are artisanal diggers. So, so just people in the villages that kind of cut. We've seen the movie Blood Diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, and the Lebanese will organize those diggers. I'm saying, again, speaking in generalizations, it's not just Lebanese, they're um, and, um, and then there are some international people. So for instance, uh, there is the largest, I believe it's the largest company in Sierra Leone, is a company called Koyu Holdings, and it's a commercial diamond mining, and they, they actually dig with machinery and pull out the main sources of, and uh, probably two thirds of the diamonds coming out of Sierra Leone come from that one uh, diamond mine. So it's and it's owned largely by farmers. So there is a local kind of component to the sector. And interestingly most of the, the jewelers in the world they want to stay away from that artisanal side of things because they know that there are they can't control that supply chain. Right? And so there are a lot of the, uh, the diamond or the jewelry companies that want to protect their image, they don't want to be associated with conflict minerals or anything. So they, they, the result is maybe not so good. And, and, and that means is that they just don't want to purchase from their business. And so the local people that are actually engaged in the industry don't get to sell to the high-end jewelers. They prefer to buy from Canada or Russia or some other country that has diamonds. And my other question is, um, what makes your organization NGO? Well, we are not an NGO. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we are an impact enterprise. We are technically, we are owned by an NGO, owned by World Hope, but we are technically a for-profit enterprise. We own an industrial space, and we rent space to companies to operate. So you're not a Yeah, it's not very big. It's got 50, 50 acres. So mm -hmm. conceivably, we have 16 factories the size of the AFJ. And right now, you only have the group company? Right now, we only have the fruit company and bringing in the steel plant. Mm -hmm. But the steel plant is going into a different site uh, in, in the continental line of California. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the impetus for um, World Hope International? on a for-profit venture in Yeah, it's a good question. And it's a question that's hard to answer because World Hope International is your traditional NGO. Like Christian, it's connected to a particular church and they do the whole gamut of things, right? And human trafficking and, um, um, you know, great other things. Um, I think that the, the program that I developed as a program manager of World Hope was just a little out there compared to its traditional fare. And so they said, I think we should, just to keep this separate and I think to create some way up, layer of independence and efficiency for first step, that we will make it into a separate for-profit entity. 
and because there was a clear, clear, uh, I think, vision for how about a, a revenue stream could come and support first step in the long run that would be based on rent and consulting revenue and things like that for the long run. But I think it was more, of, the impetus was more the fact that they just didn't know what to do with it. It was just so different than everything else that they had. I may have messed this up I'm sorry, but um, how long have you been working for World Cup? I, so I, since 2006 I worked with World Cup. In 2009 I came working with First Step. So they just kind of spun off First Step in 2009. Can you talk about how, how the leadership works with you and First Step and then World Cup, but then you've also got the, the factory who would have other owners? Yeah. Right. So, World Hope is the majority owner, and they, they um, mostly put in sweat equity to create the first step. Um, do you know sweat equity? Yes. Um, um, and then we sought out, as, we, as World Hope spun us off into a separate entity, we sought out other kind of social investors, people that would normally be giving money to an NGO, and said, well, instead of that, why don't you invest money in this impact enterprise and we will create this different model. And uh, we were able to get some of those to do that. So I, as the CEO of First Step now, report to a board of directors, and the board of directors has World Hope on it, and also these private philanthropic investors who are on that board. And so I report to them. now to the board. The tenants of the zone, we are not supposed to own the tenants of the zone. In the, in the, in the ideal world, that juice company should be there on itself and should be managed really well and they should be. The problem is they flubbed it up. <laughs> and they, the management, the guy who started it was great. He's great. He, like you talk about someone who can talk and sell you something and but managing people and organizing, he was a disaster. <laughs> sorry, Mario, I'm sorry, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll erase that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he caused all kinds of problems. And so we realized we have to take over management of this factory. And so we did. So a guy, a guy who is, reports to me is now the COO of that factory. And he's running it. In the ideal scenario, those, we don't have to worry about that. You do your business. You we give you the infrastructure, we give you the roads, the water systems, the energy systems, and you make your own factory and you run it. I don't care, right? Uh, but that didn't work out in the situation. How's the, uh, uh, is that a history of a uh, the political environment has always been unstable. Yeah. So how is that being, uh, uh, how is it now, and how has that impacted you as a CEO or as a director of a yeah. step, a step? Oh. And how, how do you see the transformation? It's, it's very, it is very cool. Everything is political in real right? And so, and getting a new factory, everyone loves, politicians love being there when a factory is opening its door. It's like, you do all this work, suddenly, and it's like, hey, I'm here, that's politicians. And that, President Coromon in Sierra Leone is awesome. But politics does affect us. The, the, the opposition, even though, so we, we purposely passed the legal agreement that went through Parliament, and we got unanimous. We, we talked about all parties. And we had to choose the colors that we wore for our ties that weren't party colors, seriously. <laughs> and, and, and be careful not to show this as a, a partisan thing. Um, but still, the party in power kind of takes credit for the development of the special economic zone. Even, you know, even politicians like Tony Blair that have been involved in Sierra Leone's past kind of Come in our round when when you cut the ribbon. Sorry, Tony Blair. Well, I'm sorry, I'll post this. I don't know. We're in a racist day. Um, and I don't know why I'm crossing. <laughs> um, 
And Sierra Leone is, has been deeply affected by political upheaval in the past. And so you have to be very careful of it. And, you, and yet you don't want to take sides. And you just want everyone to like you. Um, and I don't know how else to say it. You know, so you have to go to get to the minister and say, oh, can we do this? And there's always this opportunity for, for even now, uh, you know, the, one minister or another minister or someone will say, well, we can expedite that for you if you, you know, contribute to this or do this or something like that. So it's a, it's a really tricky balance. <clears throat> I can't really say that we've done it perfectly, uh, but uh, we haven't given any bribes to anybody ever. Uh, but, uh, that, you know, we've made some mistakes in how we organize things and when do we give credit to politicians and how. And in some opportunities, the politicians have been very supportive and very good. President Roma in particular. <clears throat> but uh, other times they've been little jerks. Maybe that's the official point. <laughs> so how have you been able to engage the local people in the, in the leadership of your organization? Yeah. So that I mean that's ultimately ultimately that my job is to get myself out of a job. And ultimately my job is to have Sierra Leone. And we have a Sierra Leonean country director. I live here in I live in Baltimore. And the country director manages it. And the creation of the special economic zone was done in a context of very kind of community centric where we acknowledged all the community rituals and and responsibilities for having land and acknowledged as a gift of the community for us. And then the, the job is then for us to make sure that community members are engaged in those supply chains that are being developed for mangoes and pineapples and papayas and other things. So say Dole comes in and takes over, what would be the, the expectations of um, maintaining a higher quality of work or, or work standards for like you know, not abusing ways. Well, he yeah. just, where, did, where does that happen? Is that like a written agreement? And if they would abuse that, then the first step would be to come in. It's a great question. And I, I actually don't know the answer to it. Uh, because right now, we've committed ourselves to serving smallhold farmers. But really, for growing pineapples, man, the best way is a big, a super big plantation. And that's the most efficient way. So we are working with. World Hope and some other NGOs to make this really robust smallhold pineapple grower initiative where our village cooperatives, the ones that do the pineapples also do pineapple, the ones that do mangoes also do pineapples. Uh, so and our job is to make sure that we can engage those smallholders in, if it is dual, that their, their supply chain for, for the, the juice plant. But man, that is a tricky one. Because you're, you're working with some fundamental structures of, of economic incentives. And in some ways you can't, even though I personally believe that having a, 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 a the healthiest form of a, of a supply structure like that includes smallholders and some big, some big, you know, it makes a vibrant competition and then things work out best. But, you know, I'm, I'm also burdened by my NGO kind of like that in the wall. And so I don't know. I don't know. Good question. How do you go about um, identifying or finding corporations that are interested in investing there? It's yeah. It's been a kind of a action. And it's we we started by advertising, but then we realized that there's just such a small pool of people that are actually interested in this. <clears throat> there, so in focused on the, the natural resources that Sierra Leone has, like cocoa, coffee, you know, fish, certain other things. And then, of course, diamonds came to mind. Gold, um, it's iron ore. So focusing on those sectors and then talking to businesses in each of those sectors is, has been what we've done. And in some, we worked really hard for a cocoa processor. And I think we will get one sooner or later. But it's just really frustrating and hard, and if they are making their own decisions based on their own uh, uh, you know, planning and their own decision. Yeah. yeah, how 
water just for a squash, like first minimum time. of employees. I'm sorry, first time. I first time ourselves? We yeah. are small. You're small. Yeah. So we have, like, let's say four people in Sierra Leone that actually make decisions. And then there are around 20 guards for the site. Mm -hmm. And then myself. Uh, after Felix Juice has between 50 and 80 employees, and they buy fruit from several thousand farmers. Um, so the, the, the people that make decisions in Sierra Leone, are they natives or are they Sure. It's, it's really nice. You, you seemed uh, very um, uh, negative about uh, uh, having the steel company. Yeah. Not negative. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. I'm positive. <laughs> because you are so concerned about the environment. And, right. Uh, so, uh, so why are you then uh, uh, trying to put a company into, uh, you know, to... Uh, why because, it was a great question. Because it is huge. It is freaking huge. <laughs> right? It is a $200 million investment for tiny country in West Africa, it has never happened before, that an integrated steel mill, and right now, that iron ore is scooped out of the ground, put on some ships, sailed it to China, make it into rebar in China, and then some of it comes back to Africa, and they use it for construction there. Right? That's stupid. <laughs> right? So, the whole, the whole social and I think motivation, the con contextual approach of First Step is we want to add value to Africa's resources in Africa. So that fit perfectly. It didn't fit perfectly because, man, they had to build a big smokestack, you know, they have to burn all this coal, they have to bring in the coal, because they don't have proper coal in Sierra Leone. It employs hundreds of young men, Good. There are things that I don't like about it. It's capital intensive, right? If, if we're if we're going to employ two hundred, you know, engage two hundred million dollars of the world war resources, I'd much rather have two hundred million dollars invested in garments and textiles factory, where you can employ just loads and loads and loads of the poorest people and just get them. Two hundred million dollars to invest in you know three or four hundred workers is nearly as attractive. To me, but again, it is huge, and the, the, the ripple effects that it will it will be big. Yeah. So, as a leader, do you see any sort of impact on the uh, on the people uh, for how uh, as long as you have been there, first step? Do you see like measurable, uh, you know, outcomes in it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the thing is. The thing is, for me, is you could look at national income statistics and export statistics and investment statistics and say, you know what, we're moving the dial. Whereas in microfinance, for as much people try and try and try, and they say, you know what, we in microfinance, we're gonna, I think we made an impact here because of this difference in this and blah blah blah. In 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 first step, you know what? We brought that juice factory to Sierra Leone, and it's exporting, and I can see it. And in those containers, there's some pictures of <laughs> standing by containers of fruit juice that would have rotted. Mangoes that would have rotted. Which countries do you export? Mostly Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Spain, um, a couple other places. I think eight countries internationally, but most goes to Europe. Now, the, the fruit juice processor hasn't been a cakewalk. Like I said, we had to let go of the, the guy who was behind it, the guy with the fire in his eye. Not, I shouldn't say let go, just kind of transition him to more of a salesman role. And it's been a pain. It's been a pain in the neck to try to get that thing going. But the fact is, it's a very relevant processor of a very relevant commodity. And a place that's perfect for pineapple has mangoes already dropping off the trees. You know, two months of the year. <clears throat> Perfect. Have you, have you done any following on the question, any type studies on the small farmers as far as the difference they have versus have you done some of those calculations? 
you know, there is a professor at Houghton College, and, and the model actually, are you familiar with Houghton? Is that Noongay teaching? No, at Overson, Ron Overson. Um, the, the, it was their model for the, de the, the development of a cooperative structure that actually gathered those pineapple, uh, mangoes, and then brought them to the SEZ. But uh, uh, it was, yeah, so, and they did a baseline, they are doing continual baseline studies. Um, and by the way, we'd love to have these kind of models. I think they actually presented that at the court, at the uh, Association of Humanities. I, I could ask you. Yeah. yeah. So they've done some impact assessment. Out of the year, the mangoes are there. What's in the other? Oh, well, there's always some smart aleck. <laughs> <laughs> that is the crux of the problem that we've been dealing with. Let me repeat the question. She said, okay, you talked about two months and there's mango. What about the rest of the year? As far as I know, that there's more than two months in every year. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be pineapples. Supposed to be pineapples. That's why Claudio did no longer learn in the pack. But, but, <laughs> but so they, they just, um, they, the, the entrepreneurs behind that factory just kind of dropped the ball in terms of planning. And they thought that they could bring in pineapples from neighboring Guinea for a competitive price to bring them to the factory and process them there and then ship them out. And pineapples, it, it isn't a high margin kind of uh, concentrate. You saw the big drums, right? They, they, they just fell in with the drums. <clears throat> they don't need refrigeration, they don't need anything. Um, but they, they, they couldn't buy them in Guinea, and I think some of the information on the pricing was wrong. And so he, he brought in investors and donors to, to create that factory. I should say also, the factory was, was supported by the Dutch government, who recognized the value. They gave 900,000 euros to have build it and finance it. And, and there are more and more programs like the Dutch program to, to develop businesses where they're needed. So, there's no pineapples, no papayas, no guavas, no host of other things, passion fruit. So they came there under the false protests, that are under a wrong protest. So, it, although it created a, an immense opportunity, Sierra Leone is perfect for growing pineapples. Perfect. The, and they kind of know how to do it already. And it's a field crop, though. They, they don't drop off the trees like you do with, with mangoes. So World Hope International now is developing a pineapple promotion. If you go to their website, www.worldhope.net, or org, um, you'll see they have a major pineapple growing initiative where they're having smallholders plant and grow pineapples in industrial densities. So the way they do it in the village level in Sierra Leone, they plant a pineapple here and a pineapple here, and they grow and they ultimately increase. Does your pineapple in Sierra Leone? Sorry? Are they growing a pineapple in Sierra Leone? Why don't you work in Guinea? We tried to work in Guinea. Yeah, that was the problem. Uh, so there is a, a juice processor. Are you familiar with Guinea also? Yeah. yeah. There is a... In the business of yeah, stable. they're not very stable. There, there is a juice processor that was owned by Gaddafi, of all people, in, in Guinea. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, so when Gaddafi died, then there was a like, upheaval in the Guinean market. But even still, it was very difficult to get fruit, to get pineapples from Guinea to Sierra Leone. To cross the border, even though it's only yeah. 150 kilometers, right, at most, it adds a ferocious amount of money and time, and you're crossing a border with border guards that are saying, okay, you know that fruit is perishable, so, <laughs> the, the, you know, <laughs> and it creates... Because, because of the pride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was talking to one of the leaders of World Cup in World Cup, and they were saying we were going to get some people from Uganda, because Uganda is very, they, they, like, they are the leading pineapple producer I think, in yeah, okay. Africa. So they were trying to get some farmers from Uganda to go to Sierra Leone and, uh, and teach uh, some people in Sierra Leone to, to do farming you know, as far as pineapple are concerned. 
I'm, I'm the other side. So how about you shift your investment in Uganda? <laughs> no, I, you know, I mean, it's a good question. I think we we have actually many opportunities to replicate first step. We've been asked even by the president of Senegal to make the exact same thing in the Casamance region of Senegal. The Prime Minister of Guinea-Bissau. We've been asked by people in Tanzania, by government officials and World Bank, to do something very, very similar, but only in the gold sector, to make a gold refinery in Tanzania. Similar things in, in, in the DRC. Now, I don't know if you can imagine the rationale for gold, but right now in, in many of the Great Lakes countries, gold is that is mined by the artisanal sector, artisanal, right, the mom and pops, whatever, that leaks out of the borders and causes a lot of problems. It, and, and, and to the extent that you could make a rationale for a gold refinery to be based in Tanzania or Burundi or DRC, then there would be a natural attachment for all that artisanal gold to come to one center place where it can be taxed and accounted for, and then the gold industry can say, we are doing something to help address the conflict of minerals space. That's a good idea. Um, but it, <laughs> I, I know nothing. I asked me two years ago, I know nothing about pineapples. So like, you know, three years ago, I know nothing about mangoes. And I asked me like five weeks ago, nothing about gold. But uh, I'm learning now that 30% of all the world's gold is refined in one place, you know, in South Africa, in a place called Germantown. And the factory is ginormous. It's, it's called Rand, Rand something. And it has, I think, processed and refined some, no, 70% of all the world's gold currently is refined there. 30% of all the gold mined since antiquity has been processed in that one factory. And the efficiency levels of doing that are just profound. And the idea of setting up a small refiner is possible. And you can even make a green refinery. But for it to compete with a big factory, you need to overcome all of the challenges that are associated with doing business in Tanzania or wherever you make it. And that includes energy, and that includes an industrial park, and that includes, you need a 7-Eleven sized building where they can just pop in their $500,000 worth of equipment and start processing gold, buying and processing. The social implications of making that factory are profound, but to get that company from wherever it will come from, to, to, make, to decide that the, that the margin is there is very difficult, but worth it, right? Somehow, for the society, the society, for the broader challenges of the whole region, it's profound. But that guy, if he can just process, I think they say 670 ounces of gold a year, a small amount, they can make a profit as long as they don't have to account for all capital expenditure, or building and generator, blah, blah, blah. So there are some interesting opportunities. So to your, whatever question it was, <laughs> the, 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 there is lots of requests for application and lots of applications, I think, for it. How much of your model is based on outside like philanthropic support or otherwise versus kind of, is it all the initial capital investment and then it's supposed to be self-sustaining or how do you? Yeah. It's not a good question. The, the model is the, the model that I had in mind was something completely different than how it's worked out. So I never envisioned that I would be running a for-profit company, and this is kind of kind of dropped on me like I, I'm not. A, you know, I'm, not a uh, I'm trying to be. <laughs> um, so yes, I. I would have to say that I envision this to be more like the way NGOs structure microfinance, where an NGO is the sponsor of a microfinance institution, and that microfinance institution might be for-profit and might have other investors, 
and the NGO would still provide grant and support because it sees the social value of that for-profit entity. That was the model that I had in mind. The way it's worked out is, no, it's a f completely for-profit. Um, I, uh, as the CEO, have to try to raise money for it by selling shares and to find social investors or NGOs that would be willing to do that, to buy and hold shares. So it's essentially a loan to this juice making factory that they're paying down and that's the return to the investors? Um, no, it's equity. So it's sh they own shares of the company. So they oh, own right. shares. The, for, the, the owners of First Step own shares of First Step and they paid for those shares. So at some point in the future, they're hoping to generate profit from, no, they're not, they don't care. You know, but in the ideal world, yes, they care. They see this as a business. They want it to weak. The, the theory, the, the theory and the practice at, this, at that level is somewhat weak and, and has been complicated for us. And partly because the lawyers are saying, oh boy, you're, you're really mixing the donor and uh, for-profit and there's realms of enormous here so that you have donors possibly giving to investors and you know all kinds of problems that we, we've tried to be intentional about addressing. But it's, it's given us a lot of headaches. Have you paid any symbolic dividends? No. Do you plan on doing so in the near future? Yes. Have you approached any of uh, the micro large microfinance capital sources like Red or Credit or others for investment? I have not. I, I would like to. I would like to, especially right now. Especially because we've gotten a lot of attention, right? We've gotten the idea of First Step sells much better than the actual financial statements. So USAID is talking to us now and saying, okay, how can we support you in a new realm of what they do, which is called the Global Development Alliance. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but basically they are seeking to support business entities and NGOs, but mostly business entities, to do things that they view as being in the broader public good. And so we are talking with them now about this global development alliance. That would be a huge realm of resources to be opened up for us in very interesting ways and guaranteed loans and, and other things. Uh, but that that would create an environment where where it's easy to develop a profitable financial up until now, it's been very difficult. Building roads, you saw the video, right? Building roads and water systems and, and lighting systems and energy systems. Oh man, it's so capital. And the, the return on that is just forever. So it's hard to, to see financial returns without, in my mind, without donor and institutional need. It is another realm where we need, I think, some intellectual help for, for sorting it out, for what is the due diligence process for companies, both socially and in terms of their financials. Yeah. At the moment, it's more seat of the pants. So some months ago, we were approached by a company that, wants to, that wanted to produce um, spirits. Uh, and, uh, and at first, I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe. But then I realized that they were talking about spirits and satchels that they especially make for motorcycle wallets or a driver, you know? Uh, it's like, uh, it's stay away. <laughs> right? And, uh, so it's probably wise. Um, and of course, because we come from the, our faith background, it's just, just about anything with arms or tobacco. Even though we've been approached for tobacco, um, it's, it's funny how the, the bad ones seem to approach first, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah. So all I can say is it's kind of more ad hoc than really robust to find. How 
does mine manage to say? Right, it's um, complicated and very, and very difficult. Sorry, should you ask the question? Uh, how is land managed? Uh, and there is, there is a kind of a very, it, it kind of depends where you are. If you're out of, if you're out of the, um, kind of the, the, kind of the main districts around Freetown, the capital, then it's, it, it follows a more traditional uh, paramount chief based um, structure. And it's very hard to really define the property rights that you would have and to even know how to buy to get those property rights. Um, but in where, where our factory is, our, fa our site is, it's, it's owned by the government. The land was owned by the government and they gave us an annual year lease. Where are you? Oh, it's in Freetown. Freetown. You mentioned something about, you know, we were talking about the work that Horton was doing, about potentially use for and all that. Are there opportunities for interns in any way, shape, or form? Absolutely. What might that look like? Absolutely, Ruby. Especially with this USAID initiative, I think there would be a very, very interesting realm of, of opportunities. Um, and, I mean, it's hard to, what Houghton has done in the past has been specifically in supply chain development for mango, pineapple, mango, and then uh, now pineapple. Um, and it's smallholder, um, smallholder based supply chains. But I think that there are some interesting realms in fresh, because there's a complicated market structure that, uh, that, that is in this industry. There should be two products that we sell. We should have fresh, and we should have the non-fresh that gets juiced. Uh, right now, we juice everything at that factory. And it can process three tons an hour, right? Um, so there's it's, it's, it's a huge, and there's no, you can't really buy fresh pineapples. It's, it's, it's there could be some interesting, for our MBA students and other like business plan development that could be unrolled um, for fresh pineapples or anything like that. Uh, or energy, like I've said before, we need some help with energy. We need some big help. Uh, USAID has expressed some interest. You, USAID, you know, yes. Um, in that stream of fresh fruit that comes in the front door, half of it comes out the back door as waste, mostly water, with very sugary water. And there's a lot of energy still in that. And in an ideal scenario, what we would do is just make a big tank, put a big bladder on top of it, and capture the gases that accelerate the emergence of the gases and burn those gases to make steam or electricity for AFJ. And just by doing that, I think that, or people have been saying that you can generate almost enough electricity for that whole plant just based on the waste the biomass waste out of that plant. E e either through anaerobic digestion or through gasification, which is a different uh, technology. But we we need help to do that. To 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 conceptualize how it works and then how then we I just have to walk around to donors and investors and try to finance it. But that is a plan for the next twelve months and that would be a lovely project. So your intention is to create a project for Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I heard you talking about MBA students. Yes. So it doesn't create opportunities for just international. Oh, of course, that, of course. <laughs> of course. I, I think anyone who goes to Eastern would have plenty of gray matter to be, you know, for just applying for just about anything, right? So, uh, so I think there there are some some interesting um, interesting opportunities in many different realms. Yeah. Uh, the farmers been engaged in planting more mangoes, or...? Yes, that's, that's a good... I, so I wish I had... Uh, there's one guy who kind of works for me. He's actually American also. And he is the only white guy that's ever played for uh, Sierra Leone professional football team. He is fantastic. And also, it's like... It's like whenever we talk to the German... The, the, there's some German donors. And they have a bunch of young women that are running it, and this guy is just so handsome and do it just like anything. <laughs> 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 but anyways, 
uh, he, he, uh, he had this initiative where all the waste mango seeds that would come out from the factory, uh, they would start sprouting. And we knew which leaves were the good kind of trees. And so we can separate out those seeds and start nursing them. So that they, and that's another opportunity. That would be a great opportunity. And, and so you can make a nursery and then start just sending out those mango trees of the higher variety to, uh, to villages around that could grow them. Right. If I was a proper businessman, I'd say, I don't want to worry about that, right? It's like, I just want to rent space in my zone and get money. That's the way I should be. Right. One more question. As far as the, um, the impact on uh, government and society, have you seen this be uh, talked about in certain ways that generates other kinds of businesses or business in Sierra Club? Like sort of related and supported. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there's a lot that's going on around it. Now, some in the context of fruit juice, but more at, at a higher level, more involved with steel. So, for instance, the steel plant itself needs more coal that can really be brought in through the country's port. So they have to make a jetty at a wharf. And there's another company who's saying is coming in, we'll build that wharf. And uh, another company saying we'll build a power plant for. So there, there, it, you, you, you do start to realize how things, how integrated and how supply chains are, are so dependent on different points. Yeah. Will you join me in thanking Richard for his time?